So we're right on time here. I guess it's our time to shine. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Open Source Drone Summit hosted by the Drone Code Foundation. Uh, we hope you're enjoying your time at the Open Source Summit. We're super excited to be here today. We have uh, lots of great content prepared for you. So let's just write, jump right into it, all right? So give me a moment while I share my screen. Awesome, so let's just get right into it. Introducing the PX4 community. I'm going to be giving you today a quick overview of the PX4 Autopilot project and the amazing community of developers and companies around it. But before we continue though, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ramon Roche. I'm, the so I'm a software engineer. I'm employed with the Linux Foundation as a program manager for drone code. I've been working in drones for the, like, almost eight years now. And I started in a small startup called 3DR uh, way back in 2013. We used to sell the first Pixel kits and also the IY kits for drones. Uh, we s went on to release the very first smart drone in the industry, the 3DR Solo using open source. And in 2016, thanks to the relationships and experience that I was looking enough to uh, half at 3DR, I joined Drone Code as a program manager. You can find me on social media, uh, send me an invite, follow me, uh, let me know how I did today. All right, so why am I here? What is Drone Code? So Drone Code is the vendor neutral foundation for open source drone projects. We are a US-based nonprofit. We provide open source governance and infrastructure and services to software and hardware projects. We're primarily funded through yearly memberships by organizations who support drone ecosystem uh, standards. The, and Drone Code is part of the Linux Foundation. So we're actively driving open standards uh, and helping member companies to create new opportunities within the ecosystem. If you look at the Linux Foundation and the collaborative projects, uh, we're much like them. Uh, we have an umbrella of open source projects within Drone Code, and I'm going to introduce all of them today. So just a quick overview of our membership. Uh, we have lots of engaged members, some of which include Autherian, NXP, Microsoft, 96 Board, 3DR, AirMap, uh, Unique, UBFi, Wingtra, Subax, um, et cetera. All right, so how did we get here? Uh, it's been a long time coming. And let me just give you a quick overview of the open source story behind the project. So it all started as a huge academic project at ETH Zurich. The story of our humble community uh, can be traced back to all the way back to 2008 at the student lab at ETH Zurich. So we were a group of, there's a group of students that was led by Dr. Lawrence Mayer. Uh, they were trying to make drones fly autonomously using computer vision. In that lab, uh, they created the first hardware and software prototypes uh, and released them as open source back in 2008. So back then, there weren't a lot of public information or resources on drones. So in, in just two years, the project had gained worldwide academic adoption. So just two years, the project took off tremendously. That by 2011, they created the PX4 Autopilot. So they put all of their efforts into the PX4 Autopilot. And um, lucky enough, by 2013, the drone DIY boom was in full swing. So there was a lot of companies that got created and the drone industry uh, matured as a whole. Uh, just like my previous employer, 3D Robotics, uh, lots of companies started looking into the open source drones as an alternative in the drone industry. And some of those companies uh, formed the Drone Code Foundation in 2014. Uh, by 2016, we managed to get broader adoption in the consumer and commercial markets. I'm going to give you a few examples of how, what that means in the next slides. Uh, by 2017, PX4 had gained computer uh, vision and obstacle avoidance. In 2018, we gained our MAP SDK, which is the MAP SDK, uh, the SDK for mapping-based drones. In 2019, the project celebrated the first uh, developer summit. We hosted that at Zurich. And we also gained very importantly, ROS2 support. So that's full ROS support within PX4. So you're able to control uh, PX4 from within ROS. 
And in 2020, which is this year, we were we were lucky enough uh, to work with our members uh, in the Drunk Code Foundation as, as part of a fixed special interest group, which I'm going to be speaking of a little bit more in detail later. Uh, we developed some of the leading standard uh, flight controllers. Um, we also have uh, two other specs that we are leading right now. The community and the market adopters have been uh, responding tremendously to the open source projects. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the PX4 adopters. So I'm going to go quickly through this because uh, we don't have quite a lot of time and there's a lot of them. So uh, just quickly, just so that you know the diversity of how, what PX4 can take, give you. So this is a hexacopter by Unique. Uh, we have a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. We have another quadcopter with cutting edge uh, standards, more takeoff and landing, vertical takeoff and landings, small reconnaissance drones, bigger, bigger drones. If you can see the drone in the background, just so they can measure the size, there's, I think, you can see a couple people on the top left, uh, just so you can measure them. We have uh, way bigger drones. This is a quadcopter that is uh, has carrying a huge payload. We also have delivery drones with vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, we have uh, huge endurance uh, mission flight drones. Those are drones that can uh, last up to 70 minutes on the air. We have medical delivery drones. We really support all type of vehicles within the PX4 stack. All right, so what is the stack? So the complete stack is the PX4 autopilot and the surrounding technologies of open source projects that got created within the project. So it's not enough to just have one, uh, the open source autopilot. Uh, when the project got created, it went hand in hand with mapping protocol, Q ground control, the ground control station and Pixhawk project. We later added uh, one of the uh, most advanced components, which is the map SDK. So right now I'm gonna focus on the PX4 autopilot real quick. All right, so it's an open source autopilot for unmanned vehicles with the very permissive BSD-3 license. We support many types of drones uh, from multi-copters to be tall, like the ones I show you in the previous slides. It's been around for uh, more than a decade and has more than 600 contributors over across the globe with a community of thousands of developers enthusiasts. So the autopilot is the core of the community and it's where everything uh, starts and where everything ends. Uh, we like to make the analogy that PX4 Autopilot is like the Linux kernel of the open source drones ecosystem. All right, so let's keep going with the open source uh, drone stack. So the next up, uh, very importantly, we have uh, Maplink. So what is Maplink? So quickly, Maplink is a trusted lightweight messaging protocol. Um, our next presenter is going to be speaking a little bit more of that into mapping in detail, how to use it and leverage it with using the map SDK. But uh, it's really important for you to understand that MapLink is the language the drones speak. So they speak MapLink with, within uh, the drones. So from drone component to drone component, you can speak MapLink. From a vehicle to a ground control station or a mobile app, you can speak MapLink and that's the way how you control it. That's how you see the telemetry. And, and that's uh, being adopted by leading industry vendors, not just by open source projects like PX4. This is being adopted by other uh, open source, uh, sorry, drone industry vendors. Next up, we got QGround Control. Uh, QGround Control has actually a uh, quite interesting story. Maplink has uh, so a so specification needed the reference implementation. So the idea behind QGround Control was to create the reference implementation and a UI for drones. So uh, the team set out to create a cross-platform um, UI engine and they utilize, are utilizing QT. Uh, and thanks to UT, QT, we are cross-platform. So we got compatibility with iOS, Android, Linux, and all the major OS vendors. It's fully customizable. So vendors can take uh, the shell of QGround control and theme it to their needs. So it's very widely adopted being commercial and, and enterprise vendors. You, what can you do with mission uh, with ground control stations? You can do mission planning uh, for autonomous flights. So you can uh, tune, set up, configure, uh, and every aspect of your drone, you can control it through uh, QGround control. Like I said, it's 
made specifically for Maplink. So you are able to leverage that and get access to all of the telemetry, including live video that you can get out of a drone. So it's a really important part of the stack. Next up, we got the hardware. The software architecture and the software stack, it couldn't be complete without having a hardware to run on. So the Pixoc project uh, that got created, that actually launched all of this, um, is a set of hardware specifications uh, and hardware controllers. And uh, it's flight controllers initially. And then this year, we're introducing smart battery management specifications and payload bus specifications. We're going really in depth into uh, cutting edge technology here. Um, there's some examples of the drones, uh, sorry, the uh, Pixel uh, products right here. Uh, we got all the way from the initial versions to the cutting edge sky node from uh, drone code member Altarian. It's really important to note that the standards that are currently in here are being developed within the Drone Code Foundation as part of the Pixar Special Interest Group. And lastly, uh, the Map SDK. So I'm going to touch lightly in the Map SDK because our next speaker is going to give you a tutorial. Map SDK is a set of uh, libraries that provides a high level API to MapLink. What this means is that you're able to leverage the specification without needing to re-implement uh, across different language stacks. So with a single mapping implementation, uh, you got one backend and you got a set of platforms and language supported. So the team was smart enough to pick up on uh, gRPC backend and that allowed them to create automatically some front ends. Uh, they have uh, Python support, uh, Java, Swift. Uh, there's uh, experimental JavaScript and Rust support as well. Uh, it's a consistent set of features and very stable API. The stack could not be complete without a huge community supporting it. Um, I want to conclude my talk today by discussing the community because it's a really important part of any open source project. And we're no different than any other. So the community of the PX4 ecosystem is divided between professional developers, drone system integrators, component manufacturers, drone hobbyists, enthusiasts. We have researchers and students still. We have open source maintainers. There's a huge community. And uh, in 2019, we met for the first time in CERC. Um, we were really lucky enough to be able to host an event for more than 200 developers in 2019. It was our first time meeting as a community. It was a really exciting time for the PX4 community and everyone uh, was very enthusiastic about it. The second year, which is 2020, we celebrated the event virtually. Uh, you can go to YouTube channel, the PX4 Autopilot channel. You can look up uh, all of the sessions from 2019 and 2020. Uh, this year, we had lots of uh, views. We have all of the community coming up to see us. Before I let you go, I want to talk to you about the community coordination efforts and what the resources are uh, within the PX4 ecosystem. So the methods of the community coordination that we primarily use are GitHub, of course. So who is not on GitHub these days? Uh, the PX4 Autopilot firmware, you can find it on GitHub right now. We have more than, I think, 10,000 forks, uh, lots of stars. Uh, the organizations that you might want to go and uh, check out are the PX4 Oracle GitHub, uh, the MapLink Oracle GitHub, and the Drone Code Oracle GitHub. Uh, the most important projects are the ones that are part of the stack, so that's a PX4 Autopilot, but that doesn't mean that it is the only project you're going to find in that organization. You're going to find other uh, subcomponents of that PX4 stack. So the PX4 stack is a huge stack. It has uh, navigation, estimation, uh, we got middleware. There's a lot of separation of concerns, it has a very modular architecture. And thanks to that, we're able to leverage uh, the uh, experience from developers and con contributors from across the range. So a lot of uh, times, uh, Contributors come here for different areas. We got roboticists, we got software engineers, we got hardware engineers, we also got graphic designers, user interface designers. We have a, all the way across the stack. So we're a very, very broad community and we're always very welcoming. Uh, we have a weekly developer call that happens on Wednesdays at uh, I think 6 p.m. Europe, uh, European time, Central European Standard Time. Uh, there's a huge community that is on our forums. We have a, a discuss 
this course uh, forum uh, at discuss.px4.io. I'm going to be distributing the slides from my presentation. I'm going to make sure that there's links to all of the resources over there. Uh, we have a huge Slack uh, team with more than 6,000 registered users. We got around an average of 500 active users on Slack day to day. So I encourage everyone to join. If you're uh, looking to get started with drones, feel free to drop in, drop a line. If you're confused, you don't know where to get started. We're really friendly. We're always onboarding new users. We have a huge contributor base and have a PX4 ambassador program that is actually helping us but with volunteering some of their time and picking up some of the uh, onboarding of the new users. So I encourage you to look that up. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter with all the monthly resources for drone code and PX4 developers. And of course we are all, uh, all over social media, you can find PX4 out of on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, as well as Drunker Foundation and uh, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We're here and we are really happy to be at the Open Source Drone Summit today. Um, I want to give a little more time to the community for QA. I know this was really fast. I wish we had more time with you today. But uh, I want to answer some of your questions if you have them. So this is a great time to ask them. I want to give you a few minutes to come up with a few questions before we move to our next speaker. All right, looks like we are getting some questions in. How are we doing on time? All right, looks like we don't have uh, questions today. No problem. Uh, I guess we can move on to our next speaker. Uh, I can introduce Gonzalo. Uh, he's going to be speaking of controlling PX4 drones with Map SDK. And thank you for your time today. I'm really glad to be here. Please enjoy the rest of the Open Source Drone Summit. I'll see you in the last session, which is the panel where all the speakers are going to be at. And I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Ah, we look looks like we have one question. So I'm gonna take one minute to answer this question. So it looks like uh, it's does weather impact communication between drones? Uh, no, uh, it can impact communication, uh, but no, it doesn't impact that. It depends on the telemetry solution that you're using. All right, so let's move on with our next speaker. Thank you for your questions. Gong, are you ready? We can see your screen. Yeah. So hi, Gong. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, Ramon, for uh, your awesome presentation. It's always good to see uh, your awesome presentations. You always contribute a lot to the PX4 uh, ecosystem, and you can explain things very good. So I'm Gonçalo Atanasio. I'm from Portugal, and I'm an um, electrotechnical engineer with a master in computers. I'm currently working at the Army, and I'm a drone enthusiast. And regarding that last part, I'm here to show you how to control PX4 drones with MavSDK. But before jumping into the cool stuff, to the live demo, I want to tell you about MavSDK. So basically, sorry, basically uh, MavSDK uh, is a MavLink library. MavLink is a communication protocol, like Ramon said. And MavSDK have APIs in different programming languages in Python, Swift, Java, JavaScript, Go, and C Sharp. And it can run on multiple platforms like Linux, Mac OS, Windows, Android, and iOS. This library provides a simple API for providing for managing one or more vehicles, uh, the programmatic access to the vehicle information, telemetry, control over missions, movement, and other operations. So this library typically can run on a vehicle-based companion computer, on a ground station, or even on a mobile device. 
this is because typically to do some art computing stuff, you need more uh, CPU power. So if you want to do uh, like avoidance, route planning or computer vision, you want to get the information from the drone sensors and do the art computations in a companion computer like Raspberry Pi and then give the actions to the drone in the result of that computations. So if you find that Mav SDK is missing any plugin or something like that you want to implement, you can always do it using C++ and then it will replicate to all the languages, but I will get that into about a minute. Right now, I want you to understand that Mav SDK uses Mavlink, but Mavlink can be used alone. Like Ramon said, QGround Control uses directly Mavlink and Mavlink is the language that drones speak. So you don't need MavSDK to use Mavlink, but MavSDK gives you a layer of abstraction. It's simpler to use than use directly Mavlink. And for example, here, QGround Control uses directly Mavlink. And like Ramon said, QGround Control provides a full flight control and vehicle setup for PX4. I have a very cool UI interface and I will show you a bit of it during the demo. So on the right, we have QGround control using Mavlink directly to talk to the drone. But here on the left, we can have Mav SDK that uses Mavlink and gives you a layer of abstraction because it's easier to code using Mav SDK than, than using Mavlink directly. I'm not saying to you do not to do not use Mavlink, but if you use Mav SDK, you can do a lot of stuff pretty quickly. And one example of that, you can do implement a new ground station, a bit like QGround ground control, or you can write a Python script to do the computation stuff I just told you about before, and then send actions back to the drone. So a bit of language bindings. So like Ramon said, you have it available in a lot of languages. But if you want to use Mav SDK in C++ directly, you don't need anything else. You just import the library and you can get information from the drone and send actions to the drone. But if you want to use it in any other language like Java, Swift, Python, Go, C Sharp or JavaScript, you need to start a Mav SDK server. You will see how easy it is doing the, during the demo. But for now, just understand that the Mav SDK server is used to expose the gRPC language bindings to the Mav SDK C++ specific methods. So this gRPC uses proto files to just uh, to just translate the C++ methods into the language specific methods. And this is very good for maintaining the code because if you just want to add a new functionality, you just implement it in C++ and then update the proto file and you will get these functionalities in all the languages. If you want to learn more about this, you can see the Jonas Vodern talk in the PX4 Web Summit 2020. He explains in the live demo uh, how you can do this, uh, how you can implement a new functionality in Mav SDK C++ and replicate it to the other languages. It's very cool. I recommend you to see it. So now let's jump into the live demo. First of all, it's very difficult to do a live demo with a real drone. So we are going to use a simulation. And to run a simulation on your computer, you can do one of two things. You can install natively the toolchain on your PC, or you can run a Docker image already built by Jonas Vodern, one of the Mav SDK maintainers. Thank you, Jonas. And this Docker image already has Ubuntu installed with all the dependencies and the simulators you need to run it. By default, this Docker image runs Gazebo. So let's try and paste it. This is going to be very fast because I already downloaded the Docker image. So it's going to run the code as, and it, you will not get any graphical user interface because this is using Gazebo Atlas. Atlas means because means that you will not get a graphical user interface, but the simulation is running on the background and you can have share of it. And because you just got a PX4 shell and you have a PX4 shell and it's always good practice to test the commands before doing anything else. So let's try and do commander takeoff. And the drone is taking off. And now let's do commander land. 
and the drone is going to land. You are not seeing anything because you don't have a graphical user interface, but I will show you right in a moment. I will build the code locally, how you can get a graphical user interface using a simulation. So like I said, to run the code locally and the simulation locally, you need to install the toolchain. For that, you can go to px4.io and here you have a button called documentation. You just go in, you go to the PX4 developer guide because we are developers and you go to getting started, toolchain installation, you select your operating system, you go to Linux, it's mine. I'm using Linux 2004. I go to Ubuntu Debian Linux. You just clone this repo, you run the script and this script by magic will install all the dependencies you need and these two simulators, Gazebo and JMAP Sim. And in the Docker image, we used Gazebo. So now let's try and use JMAF Sim. To build it, you just go into the firmware folder of the clone repo and you do make PX4 CIRL. CIRL means software in the loop, means we are using a simulated environment. And now we will specify the simulator. We will say JMAF Sim. And the code will run. The simulation is going to start and you will get a very cool graphical user interface. Cool, right? A drone in a nice green field. And now we want to test the PS4 with the PX4 shell to send some commands to the drone before doing anything else. So let's do commander takeoff. Okay, let's do it. The drone is armed, the drone is taking off and now let's land it. and the drone is landing. Pretty cool, right? Now you can see the things happening in real time. So now I just want to, I just want to show you a bit of QGround control because it is awesome. And you can have QGround control here on a Linux computer or on a Windows computer or on a Mac OS computer, or even you can have it like Ramon said on iOS or even an Android phone. When I'm using my real drone and when I'm flying my, flying my real drone, I always like to have QGround control in my mobile phone instead of bringing a computer to the field. So here I'm showing you QGround control on a Linux, but you can run it on your phone as long as you have telemetry configured on your drone and you can connect it to your phone, it's okay. So here you have the drone position in the first menu and you can see the drone in a nice green field and you can perform some actions on the drone using Q ground control. Let's try and take off. We can specify like 5.3 meters. We slide it and takeoff is detected. It's going to take off. And as soon as it reaches 4.3 meters, it's going to hold position. And now we want to land it. We can see the information here on the right. We have the compass, we have the altitude, the ground speed, the flight time. And I'm going to show you uh, real fast what are the menus of QGround control. So the first menu just have the QGround control settings. The second menu have the PX4 settings and PX4 configuration. You can see a summary here. You can upload the latest firmware here. You can select your airframe. You can calibrate your sensors here, calibrate your radio controller, select flight modes power consumption, test the motors, configure safety measures. This is very important. You can tune your drone, some camera settings and configure some specific parameters. In the third tab, you can make missions and upload them to the drone. I'm going to do one very fast because it's a very awesome feature. So let's do in take off the drone. Let's add a waypoint here, another waypoint here, and let's say return to launch right now. And we can see that the mission is going to run at five meters altitude. It's going to be a pretty fast one. So upload required. Let's upload it to the drone, done. And now let's start the mission in the main screen. The drone is going to take off until it reaches the desired altitude, in this case, five meters. Then it's going to the first waypoint, to the second waypoint, and then it's going to get some altitude because of safety measures and it will return to launch and land on the same spot it, it took off. So let's 
let's let it run. But for now, this talk is about Mev SDK, right? And using code to control a drone. That's the cool stuff because we are developers. So let's try and do it. First of all, I always like to start a Python virtual environment. So let's do Python dash M VM VM. You don't need to do this, okay? I like to do it, but you don't need to do this. So to start it, you just do source dot dash VM and bin and activate. And you can see it's activated here on the left. You got VM information. And now you can check your Python version by doing Python dash V. And I got 3.8.5. It's, it's desired that you have 3.6 or more because Mav SDK uses a library called the SyncIO that it's only available on 3.6 uh, or more, okay? So now we want to install Mav SDK and we will do pip install Mav SDK. And it's done pretty fast, right? But now, like I said, MavSDK uses another library called AsyncIO. This library allows you to make asynchronous requests and wait for its response. Because when you, when you are talking to a drone, you want to send uh, action, but you want to await its response to make sure it's implemented or executed correctly. So to do that, you need to run an event loop of AsyncIO. And if you want to write this in a REPL console, you need a, a synchronous REPL console. And for that, you need to install another library called AO console. And it's done. So now instead of doing Python, I'm going to do a Python and you will get a console running an async IO event loop and we can await calls. So first of all, Let's write our first uh, Mav SDK commands. Let's do import Mav SDK. And now, like I said, we need to start the Mav SDK server. And for that, we are going to do drone equal Mav SDK dot system. And now we need to connect to the drone. So let's do drone. Sorry, we need to await drone dot connect. And we connect it to the drone. We can see here on the top, we have a partner IP on localhost. It's true because we are running MavSDK server on localhost. So now let's await and let's do drone.action.arm because we need to arm the drone before takeoff. So let's do arm and now let's do takeoff. And the drone is taking off. Pretty cool, right? It just commanded our drone using Python code. And now let's land it. Await drone.action.land. And we landed the drone. So now we wrote this code using a REPL terminal. But what if you want to write this code using a Python script instead of a REPL terminal? It's a little bit different. So I'm going to show you how to do it. You don't have to use PyCharm. I'm using PyCharm, but you can use VS Code or Atom or your favorite IDE. I use Py, PyCharm for Python because I find it very helpful regarding the awesome intelligence. So I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call it takeoff and land.py. And I'm going to start by importing MavSDK. And here you have IntelliSense, so it's easier to write. And I'm going to import a SyncIO too. So we need to implement an asynchronous function. We're going to do a sync def run. And now we need to do the thing we did before. We need to start a MavSDK server. So we're going to do drone equals MavSDK.system. And here we have IntelliSense, so we can check the input parameter of system. We have two. We have the MavSDK server address and the port. For the MavSDK server address, by default, it's localhost. And the port is 551, so let's keep it that way. And now we have to await drone to connect. So let's do drone.connect. And we can say, we can see that it takes up one parameter, system address. 
And by default, this system address is UDP localhost 14540 port. And this is one of the ports where Mavlink is running on the drum. So let's also keep it that way. And for now, because we are running a script, we need to make sure that the drone is connected. Okay, so we will do a sync for state in drone.core.connection state, and we will check if state dot is connected. We can print something like awesome drone is connected, and we break the loop. And now that the drone is connected, we want to perform the same actions we did before. Like we need to await drone.action.arm. And next we want to await drone.action.takeoff. As you can see, we have intelligence is much, much easier to write. And now we want to hold position for 10 seconds because we are writing a script, it's running very fast. And if we do take off and land, it will take off and land immediately. We will not see almost anything happening to the drone. So we want to wait for 10 seconds. And to do that, we are going to use an async IO function called sleep. And it takes up the number of seconds we want to sleep. We will say 10 because it's Friday and we write we are tired, okay? So let's await now the drone.action.land. And we will land the drone. But now we just declared an asynchronous function. We need to call it to run it. And for that, we are going to declare a main function, okay, in a very Pythonish way. And now we need to get an event loop from a syncio. And we need to say loop dot run until complete the function we just implemented. And our script is done. Now we just have to run it and see if it runs. Python take off and land dot pi. So awesome drone is connected. It's going to take off. And the demo gods are with us. So 10 seconds and it's going to land. Very cool, right? So this is very simple, right? But if you want to do some more complex stuff, you don't have to start from scratch. You can always go to the Mev SDK repo maintained by Julianos and um, Jonas Vodern. And you can see here a folder called examples. And here you can check all the examples it has here, like calibration, camera, geofence, gimbal, and even, even one called mission.py. This mission.py does almost the same thing we did using QDrone control. It uploads a mission to the drone and the drone run it, runs that mission. And I have it here locally, so I can show you. I can do Python and I can do mission.py. Waiting to drone to connect, upload the mission, arming in starting the mission. I can show you here the code very fast. And here it's done the same thing we did. We connect to the drone. We will wait, we make sure that the drone is connected. We declare some mission items and append them to a list. We upload the mission to the drone. We arm the drone, we start the mission and we wait for the mission to hand. So, if you want to do complex stuff, you don't always need to start from scratch. You can always, can always check the examples first if anyone already did this and start from there. So now let's get back to the presentation. And I want to ask you, why my SDK? You just saw what I did and do you found it difficult? It's not difficult, it's very easy easy to install, easy to use. This was the, the thing that catch me in the beginning. I was trying my SDK and I thought, this is it. This is that easy. You can run a simulation and command the drone in a couple of minutes. You don't need to have all the tool chain installed if you, if you want. You, you just need to run the Docker image and have Python installed and you can run it. So as you can see, it's easy to install. It's easy to use as a very stable API. 
there are a lot of production uh, environments already using Mav SDK. You can trust it. And as you can see, it's cross-platform and multi-language. So if you don't like Python, you can use it in Java or Swift. And if you don't like Linux, you can run it on Windows or Mac OS. So you can try it whatever operating system you are using and in the language you like the most. And as you can see, it's very accessible. So if you want to imp implement a new functionality, you just write it in C++, you update the proto files and the language bindings are auto-generated. Like I said before, if you want to learn about this, just watch the Jonas Voderm talk in the Web Summit 2020. It's very insightful. So just use the code, okay? And a bit about documentation. I know Ramon already talked about this, so I'm just going to show you where to find it. These links I have here, you just have to go to px4.io, you go to documentation, and here on the bottom, you, you have the PX4 developer guide that will show you how to get started with the PX4 codes and how to contribute, how to build the code locally, run your first application and stuff like that. So if you just want to learn the QGround control user guide, how to use QGround control, all the man is explained, you can go to the QGround control user guide. And if you want to know how to develop for QGround control using Qt like Ramon told you about, you can go to QGround control developer guide. If you want to know about Mavlink, how the protocol is implemented, how the bytes are used, the messages and stuff like that, you can go to the Mavlink guide. And if you will want to learn more about Mav SDK, you can go to the Mav SDK guide. It will show you all the languages implementations. It will point you to the repositories on GitHub and you can check them thoroughly. So you have also drawn code camera manager. Here, the documentation we are right now, it's the user guide. And here you can learn how to fly a drone, how to choose your uh, airframe, how to choose hardware, how to choose your flight modes. You can learn a lot about in the user point of view. So just go and check it. It's very cool. And last but not least, like Ramon said, we are a very awesome community. So if you have any doubts about any of that, you can just go to Slack channel or discuss forum and ask us for stuff. We are going to help you. And if you find any bugs, you can always try and fix them and submit a pull request on GitHub and the maintainers will review it and will help you through it. Or if you find any issue you can solve, you can always open an issue on GitHub. And our community is awesome. And we, got, we would like to get more people involved. And if you want to get involved, just talk to us. Every pro was once a noob. So don't be afraid to ask questions. None of the questions are, are not meaningful. All the questions are meaningful. So if you want, just send them. Right now I'm here available for a Q&A too. So if you want, just pop the questions in the Q&A and I will try and answer them. So I'm here for you. I hope you like the presentation and the live demo. So in the first example, there was a wait of 10 seconds to not have landing immediately after takeoff. Can you give an example to go to the next command after the first is finished? For instance, for instance, instead of takeoff, you have to take off and climb to X meter altitude. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Gong, I think it's really important here to let the audience know that the complexity on the map link spec side has been mostly taken away by the map SDK. So it's also really hiding some of the implementation details yeah. and some of the uh, interfaces on the action uh, plugin for the map SDK, like uh, takeoff and landing, have default parameters. So you can actually set takeoff with 10 meters, takeoff with 100 meters, and you can say that. or uh, PX, that's actually coming in all the way down from PX4. PX4 determines that the way, the how you take off, how you land. Uh, like uh, in one of the examples, Gong showed you that the drone was going to take, uh, like ramp up and start uh, going up before it landed. Yeah. That, that's a safety feature. So yeah. those are all configurable by parameters and MapSDK uh, 
does magic in the back end to hide some of that stuff for you, but you are able to expose that back and control it again. Yeah, true story. So thank you, Ramon, for the answer. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you can specify the altitude you want and you can spe specify the safety measures. So uh, it's it's a default behavior by because of the safety measures implemented, like Ramon said and you can always specify it. And you can see all about in the documentation of the, of the MEV SDK Python, you have the methods explained and the parameters it takes and how, how are the default values implemented. So let's go to the next question. Can we run the code in a virtual machine? Does it require a lot of memory and disk space? No. It does not require a lot of memory and disk space. My laptop is pretty old, as six years old, and no, this, this is not a, a MacBook or something like that. Uh, so I have run this virtualization with four gigs of RAM and a dual core CPU. You can run it. Uh, probably you will not get very complex words, worlds using gazebo or something, but if you just use JMFSIM or simple worlds, you don't need a lot of RAM to run it. So try it, try the Docker image first if you want to try it. And if you are okay with it, uh, just jump into installing the tool chain and run it, the, run it directly on your machine. That's the advice I get to you. So next question, very nice demo, thanks. Uh, I am curious if there is any manual how to create drone from scratch with Debian Linux system, what extension cards to use and how to set up software, etc. I have our time to find out to connect to DX6i to base board. Okay, I think I have I have an AI AI 6B, so I don't have that specific hardware, but if you want to create a drone from scratch with Debian Linux, uh, I have, I don't know if you are has, asking about hardware in the loop. Uh, if you are asking about hardware in the loop that is running a simulation with hardware connected to your PC, there are a lot of tutorials there for you to follow in the PX4 documentation. Uh, I, all, I tried it, you just connect your board with the hardware connected to it, and you can run the simulation in your PC and get the information from your real sensors in your drone and have the simulator running, and you can perform operations using QGround control or MEV SDK. And I don't know if this, what you are talking about. So if you want to specify it, if I can answer it more correctly, and I just want to extend on your on your answer, Kong, if you allow me. Uh, the there exists a lot of the DIY kits right now to assemble that allow you to assemble a quick drone. So a lot of the drone code mem there's a couple drone code members that offer kits. Like one of them is Holybro. They have a really good kit including everything you need: motors, uh, telemetry, a flight controller, and um, Airframe. There's also another one by uh, Gold Member NXP. Uh, they actually have an awesome uh, development challenge called Hover Games, and they also offer their uh, flight controller, airframe, and all of the components needed to assemble your drone. It's really important to note that the PX4 autopilot runs on an Arctos called Apache Nautix. Uh, so the flight controllers will run on the flight controller unit, and then if you want to add a companion computer, you can do that through a serial port. And on the later, uh, the most recent versions of TechSock, where you can use a more uh, high-speed connection back to your uh, uh, companion computer. So you can have that configuration. So it depends on the topology that you'd like to run. So you can have your companion computer running on top your, of, of your drone, or you can have that companion computer uh, sitting on your desktop uh, when you're yeah. piloting. And you can have a telemetry radio like the DX6i uh, that you were mentioning. Yeah. True story. And you were asking about real hardware. Yeah, I didn't understand the question correctly. Ramon understand it correctly. So you wanted to have a companion computer. Yeah, you can have a companion computer. You don't need to install the autopilot on the companion computer. You just need, for example, a Raspberry Pi, for example, install it Debian, and then you can install ROS, use MavROS, or you can use MavSDK, install Python and use MavSDK, and connect that companion computer directly to the to the 
to the Pixoc, or you can have it local uh, on your on your desk, like Ramon said. So yes, you can do it. You don't need to install PX4 on it. PX4 is running on an autopilot, so you just need to install the tools you want to give information to your uh, autopilot using Mavlink. Okay, I don't know if you understand it, and if I can explain it a little better. Yep, and I think it's also mentioning 96 boards, um, and 96 boards is also a member, and they're actually going working right now and releasing a mezzanine board that includes the FMU spec, so they're a pixel compatible mezzanine board by 96 boards. Uh, and I also want to throw in, in there that Gumsticks recently launched a uh, Raspberry Pi version of FMBU V6 spec. So it's a Pixel bundle within a Raspberry Pi 4. So that's a really cool uh, board. We'll, I encourage you to go and check it out. It's like Gumsticks. And that's a, one of the latest uh, Raspberry Pi for uh, the compact version that we released. So I think there are no more questions. So I'm going to pass my word to Travis Botalico. So I hope you like my presentation. I'm here in the end for some more questions if you have them. Uh, so thanks a, a lot, Ramon, again. And right. sorry, sorry, Thank Travis. You, Sorry, Travis, I think I got one more question here. <laughs> I'm going to answer it really fast. Newbie question, do you only do flying drones or are you also sailing and riding drones? Uh, yeah, you can install PX4 on all kinds of robots. You can install it in robots too, not only in flying drones. You have aquatic drones too and land drones too. So it's not explicitly to flying drones. Correct. We support underwater vehicles as well as rover. And yeah. they're supported all the way down to simulation as well. Yes. Gong, thank you so. for your awesome presentation and your awesome demo. Uh, I love your fearless uh, attitude towards demos. And it, I think it's one of the things that runs in within the Map SDK community. And I want to keep yeah. encouraging that. Thank you for your time. Uh, if you have more questions for Gong, he's going to be available together with me and the rest of the speakers on the panel that is going to be uh, hosted after Travis' talk. So next up, we got Travis from Model AI. He is going to be giving us a quick presentation on a quick 360 overview of how to get started with PX4. Go ahead, uh, Travis. Thank you. All right. You guys able to see my screen? Let me know if not. <laughs> Well, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Travis Botolico. I'm an engineer at Mole AI, and um, kind of um, going off that one of those last questions about companion computers and hardware. Um, I'm kind of going to dive into that a little bit deeper right now. Um, my main goal today is to describe the uh, benefits that uh, we've experienced uh, using the drone code hosted projects uh, uh, with respect to bringing products to market, and um, we're using products in the autonomous systems area. Um, so a, a quick background on myself, um, uh, my career has been around uh, embedded systems, product development, uh, electronics manufacturing. Um, up until about a year and a half ago, I was focused mainly in uh, pro uh, solving problems in like the industrial IoT space. Uh, I worked for SKF uh, bearings for a decade or more. Um, so. I'm kind of a newbie uh, in the field of robotics and drones, uh, and really the use of the drone code hosted projects has been crucial to re reducing the learning curve for uh, me. Um, it's been awesome and um, uh, a little bit more specific. Um, I've been responsible for uh, bringing up PX4 on our hardware, um, which I'm going to show in, in a little bit. Um, so uh, as a silver member of drone code, Model AI contributes hardware and software development to uh, advance the uh, growing ecosystem um, uh, of the open source PX4 ecosystem. So we, we build drone perception and communication systems and uh, all while the whole time leveraging the drone code hosted projects that uh, Ramon and Ghana have uh, been talking about. Uh, we have a, uh, one of our products is a Voxel Flight, which I'll show in it. It's a combination of a PX4 flight controller um, and then also a, a companion, com companion computer. And um, 
it enables drones with autonomy and our use cases are in the military delivery asset inspection um, um, bunch of every day it's like a new use use, uh, use case which is pretty pretty cool uh, so at model ai it's a, it's we're at 18 folks and we're heavily skewed towards the engineering side of things um, so what i, what I want to do is kind of walk you through the the a quick uh, theoretical or not theoretical but a quick uh product re release cycle uh, as kind of a story to show you the benefits that we've um, had through the drone code project. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, a quick hardware de design stage. So here's a few of our products. Uh, a key component on the left is the flight controller subsystem. And that's uh, essentially what you saw in Gon's demo flying around um, and we've we've leaned heavily on the drone code hosted projects th throughout. So when designing hardware, uh, like any complex system, there are choices that can be made during the design phase, and that could limit uh, potential problems in the future, right? So, drone code has a uh, hardware working group, and our team has been involved with that. And uh, that the goal of that group is defining open standards to promote interoperability and. Um, it works closely with the Pixoc project. So the standards provide readily available hardware specs and guidelines for drone systems development. And what we did is we, we leveraged two of those standards, uh, the first being the Pixoc uh, revision V5X standard. And uh, we use that as a mechanism to, to lay out our system architecture. Uh, it defines the connections between the microcontroller, the different peripherals, and it helped us to drive component, component selection. Um, the other uh, standard is the Pixoc connector standard. And uh, you can imagine uh, when you're exposing pins to the various connectors uh, that you could see on those boards, so lots of plugs, um, it, it ensures a high level of interoperability with the various vendors of different hardware that could plug into those products, right? And by adopting these standards, we've reduced the amount of time needed to gather requirements and to design. And at the same time, we're taking risk away. And what I'll show next is it really helps with firmware uh, development and bring up by following these uh, standards. So at this point, let's pretend that we've designed our hardware using the, uh, the standards from the last page. And then we'll, you'll move into kind of the, uh, during manufacturing or um, after design and manufacturing, you'll start to be working on the firmware, right? So in, in, in my case, uh, this was the first time I was exposed to really anything in the drone code projects. It was, uh, I got hardware given to me and said, let's bring the firmware up. So I was really a newbie, never used PX4. Um, so I want to give an example of the usability of the project and, um, Really, we had a vehicle flying within a few weeks after starting, and uh, I, I'll, that's not my skill. That's really the, um, the amount of uh, resources and ease of use provided by the uh, PX4 uh, code. So uh, a little bit busy here, um, but uh, I think it's well worth spending some time on this, on this slide. Uh, the PX4 firmware, it's very feature rich. Uh, I try to capture some of the high level functional blocks that uh, you might want to or might need to develop on your own when you're developing an autopilot um, on an embedded system. And uh, if, if, if nothing else, the key takeaway is the limited amount of effort required to bring up the board when using PX4. Um, the, the, our, uh, the main body of work for us uh, is what you could consider the, the board support package area. Uh, this is where you need to let the firmware know where the pins are, lo are located, uh, basically the pinout of the microcontroller. So if, if you're doing any kind of embedded development, that's your typical like board.h, right? And within the PX4 code base, there's uh, multiple boards to reference. So what, what we did is at the time, the uh, FMU V5X was coming out and we, we kind of did a copy paste of that template and then had to do some small tweaks, mainly because we weren't 100% in line with the standards due to our own con constraints. Um, and then the, uh, as mentioned before, PX4 is running on top of NUDX, uh, the uh, real-time operating system. And um, 
that that has like your typical menu config. Uh, so you could kind of run that and then set up the underlying stuff as well. So it's, it's very usable, very usable. Um, the next the next area of, of work you could think of is in the drivers area. So PX4 has a lot of drivers and it's ready to support most of your common components. Um, for example, uh, we have three IMUs. Um, two of those were ready out of the box. One we had to get a driver going and uh, we, we had the hardware, we didn't have the driver in place. And we, uh, we sent our hardware out to uh, uh, the PX4's main architect, Dan Agar, and he actually wrote the driver for us. So that was very cool. Um, and uh, we implemented a new barometer driver um, and then like a power module. But in, 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 in most of the cases, all the drivers were there. So the driver architecture, it's like super clean and it's operating on this published sub subscribed style message bus. Um, so it's, it's very de decoupled and easy to get in there and um, to start working on. Um, there's tons of references in the drivers area. So for like a magnetometer, barometer, IMUs, heaters, that's, it's, it's, it's awesome. There's just tons of drivers. Um, and lots of times you could kind of copy paste and then tweak if you need to add a new component. Um, so, so we barely did any work in the drivers. Um, and then after that, we had to work on the bootloader, which really was a, a minimal amount of work. So in order to get uh, the firmware update mechanism in place to allow, uh, we saw earlier Q ground control as a firmware update mechanism. So uh, we had to add our board to the boot, the bootloader, but it was um, under, under a few lines of code there. Um, the rest of the code was used out of the box. So uh, you can see on the bottom right of the slide, there is uh, my GitHub handle for PX4 and uh, 14 commits only under under 7,000 lines of code. And we got a board up and out to, to market. Um, so, so what we use out of the box uh, is the actual flight controller. Uh, this is where like the super smart people like gone in the previous um, talk, uh, they're doing a lot of work. Uh, I didn't, we didn't touch that. Um, we used it out of the box. That's huge effort uh, saved. Um, you get a proven firmware update system. Uh, so you could use Q, Q ground control and you could push your firmware changes through, through that. So the users out in the community will automatically, automatically get, get that. Um, you get a, a really robust logging system uh, where you could get all the, de the details from all the sensors, everything that, that you need. And um, you get a proven message bus the architecture is very nice. Like I mentioned before, it's a decoupled kind of system, very clean. Um, uh, huge thing, uh, you learned earlier that there's the Madlink pro protocol that we're using out of the box. And so this prevents you from having to roll your own, spend all the time learning what you're missing as you build features in. So you can just take that out of the box and use it. And it covers most of the use, the use cases that you would, you would need. Um, uh, another cool thing is the, uh, the ecosystem is set up with CI servers. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we shipped our hardware out to Dan Agar and he put our hardware in the CI rack. So uh, every time there's a pull request, um, the, the code base is ran on multiple tar targets and uh, you can find problems early. Okay, so I'll just say that the firmware bring up, it was a piece of cake. So um, you'll saw, you saw it was like 7,000 lines of code and we got a board going. Um, so after we did that, we kind of need to move into the system validation part of, the, of uh, product development. And um, uh, again, we've leveraged the drone code hosted projects. So when you're bringing up a new product, uh, you can spend a lot of time building up your own tools to validate your design. So Q Ground Control, it, it, it offers extensive visualization and configuration. And we use this extensively during driver valid validation. Um, through, through Q Ground Control, you could also get access to the NUTX shell. So if you want to get down to like the terminal, which actually you saw gone, gone do um, during during development and validation, that's a very cool thing. You can get to like the PS command top. You can kind of see where resources are going. Um, 
there's a, a huge parameter set that's that's available throughout the, the projects and it allows you to customize and tweak settings. Um, you can imagine on an IMU, you could have uh, things like digital filters and PID settings. Um, and there's, so there's a uh, there's work workflows to handle all these these tweaks and, and tuning. So one of the one thing which I didn't realize for a while was you can change uh, PID settings mid flight. So you're flying a drone in our net down the stairs, and you could you could adjust uh, the uh, feedback controller settings, and uh, it gets pretty 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 wild. So it's pretty pretty cool. Um, and uh, a very a very awesome thing is that the end users in this product space they they know these tools very well. Um, so you can rely on the drone code hosted projects being in their workflows, and you really just need to ship hardware out, and they'll be comfortable with it. So I could send I have never uh, met Gan before uh, this this these talks, but um, I could send him our hardware, and he would be instantly. Uh, capable to uh, use it because of the ecosystem. And that's like, very cool. Uh, so this is just uh, kind of a graphical overview. Um, and it's an example of, of how we're using kind of a bring your own hardware, of, of, uh, bring your own hardware approach, um, where the main components of the architecture um, for the standard use cases are brought to you by the drone code hosted projects. So this is our uh, Voxel 500. It's like a fully built autonomous drone for developers, but the, the core pieces you can see there, we're using um, PIXOC uh, standard compliant connectors, and that allows us to connect things like a Hollybro G, GPS and MAG to it. Um, we have the PX4 firmware running essentially out of the box, just our board support packages in there. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you. We could we have the Mav SDK or Mavros. We could run that in Docker on this on this guy, and um, throughout the whole time, we're using Q Q ground control as a as a kind of a front end for visualizing and keeping track of things, and that that's communicating over the Mavlink pro protocol. So uh, I kind of uh, leaning on the. Um, why I feel it's awesome um, to have this ecosystem is here's an example. We, we shipped our hardware down to uh, the drone code test team down in Tia, Tijuana and uh, we did ship them hardware. And hopefully you guys can see this video. Um, it allows us to, again, because of the ecosystem is, is such a feature rich setup and the, the support is awesome. We can kind of send hardware out and people know how to use the product. So this is us getting field valid validation from a team we never met in person. Uh, we just shipped the, the drone down. I think uh, Ramon has it in his uh, office right, right now. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that's a huge benefit. Um, so we saw this slide, uh, this graphic uh, by Ramon a little bit ago, but um, it's a similar experience that I've had with most of our customers, which is a pleasure. And it's the onboarding process um, is already out there and out in the world. It's known and it's a usable process. So, so what you get is this potential potential user base that's already familiar with the product, the workflows, and the experience. And that by itself has been a, a huge time save, and we've benefited from, from that a lot. Um, so at this point, um, you saw that the drone was flying around. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's in a usable state. So um, in our simplified product release cycle, uh, we have the, fundam the fundamental vehicle and ground control station working. Uh, so for, for most of the use cases, you'd, you'd be set. Um, so a limited amount of work, uh, followed the hardware standards, used the uh, PX4 ecosystem and the drone code hosted projects like Q, Q route control to kind of validate. And now we have a functional product. Um, so, so, so at Model AI, uh, we're focusing on drone perception and communication systems. And uh, so I'm going to describe a few of the use cases that we're working on now and go a little deeper into the flight controller and companion computer system. So uh, 
I'm a, I'm a geek and you know, there's lots of geeky data here. So bear, bear, bear with me. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is our, our voxel flight at a high level. Um, on the left side, uh, we have the PX4 based flight controller. Um, so this is using like a typical ARM Cortex. Uh, it's an M7 processor, uh, 216 mega, megahertz. Um, we have a bunch of sensors and interfaces over there. So it's three IMUs, um, five UARTs, two I squared C, GPIO, a bunch of inter interfaces. So that's where all those connectors are, right? And um, what we do is we, we kind of marry this flight controller with a companion uh, computer in, in one. And um, that's our voxel-based companion, com companion computer. And this has a bit more computational power. It's using a Snapdragon 821, which is a, a quad core processor. Uh, it has a uh, Adreno G G GPU on, on board. Um, it, it allows us to do things like object detection uh, using TensorFlow Lite at like 720p, 20 frames per second. Um, we have two DSPs. Uh, one of those DSPs that can actually run PX4, um, but we're not we're not doing that at this point. But it's 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 possible. Um, so that's kind of um, that gives us some horse horsepower um, on the companion computer side to do things for like vision. Um, so to help with perception, we have several camera interfaces on there as well. Uh, we have three MIPI. Uh, CSI2 interfaces. We have uh, USB UVC support, which is basically like a, a USB camera. Um, we could do HDMI input and we could do 4K 30 video capture, uh, H264, 265 hardware acceleration on there. The companion computer itself adds two more IMUs and even more UART, I squared C, G, G, PIO. Um, it's got built-in Wi-Fi, uh, which you can use to connect to Q ground control. And um, we could also slap on uh, these mezzanine boards on top that um, add on things like 4G LTE. And uh, another thing, which uh, is micro hard um, for like point-to-point -point communications. Um, so this guy's, it's, it's, uh, it's size, weight, power, cost optimized. So it's, it's coming in at under 24 grams and it's, it's uh, less using less than 10 watts of power so it's kind of a small form factor meant for uh, drones with a lot of uh computational power there so that's that's kind of the hardware geeky specs um so how does drone code how do the drone code hosted projects fit into the system um we're we're using px4 out out of the box so we've just added our board support uh layer um and what we do is we can communicate again with the Mavlink protocol, and we're doing that through a, a internal UART bus. So at like 921 kilo, uh, K baud rate, we uh, have the flight controller communicating with the companion companion com computer using uh, Mavlink out of out of the box. Um, so with respect to um, the companion computer software. Uh, we're using a Yocto built Linux, uh, which I think this uh, crowd should be familiar with. And we have um, an open source kernel that is available and you could build, build that and modify as needed. Um, a very, uh, a, a feature I like is we have Docker on target. So you could run Docker on here. So um, you could get like Ubuntu on there, Alpine. Um, built in is ROS, uh, Indigo into the image, OpenCV is built in. Um, and then that's kind of baked into the image. And then on top of that, uh, we have a suite of open source tools hosted on GitLab, um, where we have our production applications and examples. They're all available, and it shows how we support things like indoor navigation, obstacle avoidance. Uh, we use April tags for uh, uh, relocalization. Um, we're gonna have a demo of that here shortly. Um, I, there's examples of how to uh, utilize the various camera interfaces, uh, hardware acceleration methods, um, examples of, of how you would run code on the CPU, the GPU, or the DS, DSPs, um, examples of how to use the um, modem add-ons, um, and then 
we have a collection of Docker images, like we have a Docker image for Mav SDK, uh, C++, Mav SDK, uh, Python, um, Mav ROS. So you could uh, pull those, do Docker pull from our uh, Google Cloud registry hosted um, Dockers, and then you could put that on target and then you could have Mav SDK on target. Uh, so on the companion, com com companion computer. Um, so uh, kind of the high level from this is uh, in general, we're trying to make um, all the work, uh, all the code uh, well-documented and open source and uh, best um, kind of best practices of how to use the hardware and make that available to anybody to uh, use. Um, so uh, in, in light of trying to make things easy to use, uh, we, uh, we want to also just provide you with or provide people with hardware that they could kind of take out of the box and use. Um, so on, on the left side, we've taken that Voxel Flight, uh, which is a flight controller and companion computer, and we put it into what we call the flight deck, which basically gives you the perception up front. And that's, um, you get stereo cameras, a, a 45 degree downward facing tracking camera with a fisheye lens. Um, and you have a 4K uh, camera for uh, FPV or like object detection. Um, and that that's in like a, vi a vibration isolated mount and you could mount that onto your own drone uh, or a rover or not a sub, I think it would get too too wet. But um, the idea here is you could take that and then put it onto a drone um, or a ro robot and then um, get vision um, from it. Um, and then the next step is just, we we have basically a Hollybro S5, uh, S500 frame um, that we put our flight deck on top of and kind of build it up and test it and put it in a box and ship it out. Um, and that's our Voxel M5 500. So um, before drones, I was in just doing embedded development on uh, kind of static products uh, stuck to a, a pump in a factory. Um, but when we would, when you'd like say you're using like a Nordic NRF blue Bluetooth module, you would buy a, a little development board and then you'd start working on that development board um, at, at, at your desk. And then you'd start working on the features and then build up what the code would, would look like. And then you could build your own hardware and then get your code running on that. So that's kind of the same idea that we're trying to do here. Um, kind of uh, give a, a pre-canned kind of working solution and you could develop code on top of that for your own uh, feature set that, that you would need. Um, so uh, I think next we will talk about some of those. Um, so here's a, a video that's showing um, our lab downstairs. And uh, as the video goes, hopefully it's showing up okay for you guys. Um, what we're doing here is we have a GPS denied environment. So there's no way to get a, a location from a radio and we're using perception to kind of track where the, the vehicle is um, af, uh, uh, throughout flight. So you could get kind of an XYZ in space. Um, and um, the other thing we're doing here is um, the, the feature is called visual uh, inertial odometry. So odometry is kind of like an odometer in a car, which you can you could use to tell how far you're going. So uh, I'm a, a VIO, uh, it tells you where, where you've gone since you've uh, started, um, but not exactly where you are in space. So using uh, fiducial markers like uh, April tag, which you see on that crate right there, it's a, uh, almost like a QR code. Um, using the same perception system, we can see that tag and then re relocalize uh, in space to exactly where that tag says the drone is. And you can imagine um, the, a use case being um, inside of a shopping center and you're going down like the aisles of a shopping center. And so the drone can tell where it is X, Y, Z in space while flying down the aisle. Um, you get like a 1% drift. Um, so after 100, 100 meters, you might be one meter off and you could use these April tags to kind of relocalize and kind of snap back. So 
what you'd be able to do is fly a drone um, throughout an indoor area with precise low location. And um, the way we're doing that is uh, using PX4 out of, out of the box. Um, we have a Mavros um, running inside of a Docker and Mav Mavros is uh, kind of uh, acting as a, the, the flight manager or commander, and it's telling the drone where to, where to fly, like go 10 meters forward and then go 10 meters to the right. Um, and then the, the visual perception system is keeping track of, okay, where am I? And then the April tags are basically saying, okay, you think you're here, but I'm gonna correct you a little tiny, tiny bit every so, every so often. Um, so, so, We've, we've heavily used the PX4 firmware for all the actual flying and then Mav, the Mavros um, for communicating throughout. Um, and it's been a, a, a nice kind of uh, flight there. Um, I'm gonna do another demo here. So this is a, another um, use case that's very common in it's uh, collision prevention. So basically, you don't want to fly into something, right? So that something in this video is the whiteboard in the background. And what we're doing here is um, our companion computer is using the stereo cameras, kind of like human eyes. And um, it, it, can, it can find depth from stereo, just like your eyes and your brain do. And we can calculate um, distances uh, in, right in front of us. And we will pass a Mavlink packet over to PX4. Um, it's called obstacle distance. And it's basically in, in an array of distances in front of us. Um, the drone could be tipping forward and we could see still forward like this and calculate what's actually in front of us to prevent the drone from hitting something. Um, so, so, so modal AI isn't doing the collision prevention. We're doing some, uh, we're doing the object de de detection. So seeing, passing that data over to PX4 and then PX4 is handling the rest uh, by limiting the, the, the sticks. So um, you can imagine PX4 uh, that there, or the ecosystem gives you a bunch of parameters. So you could tweak like how far away from an object you're allowed to fly. Um, so out of the box, you could, you could get that kind of uh, set up through PX4, Mavlink and Q, Q ground, ground, ground control. Um, Another use case is uh, we use Mavlink over 4G LTE. So um, uh, we mentioned that, uh, Gon mentioned that we have video uh, streaming capabilities in Q ground control. And there's actually a H.264 video decoding in Q, Q ground control. So what we could do is we could take like a 4K FPV video um, and we could encode it H.264 send it over over wireless to Q, Q ground control and we could visualize the actual flight as it's happening. Um, the other thing we're doing is all the command and control uh, features um, are happening through uh, Mavlink over the same wireless link. So, so what, what we have here is Eric is in uh, the office. He's setting up the mission and flying it and then about 15 miles away our flight test area, we have um, like a pilot in command that's out there watching because legally we can't we can't do this yet. But um, we're we're starting up the mission from remote and then flying the mission and then being able to stream the video over. And uh, we're using other open source stuff like OpenVPN is um, running on target, and we have OpenVPN server which is acting as kind of the mechanism to uh, to allow us to go over the internet. Um, and then control a drone. So uh, if there was no legal ramifications for this, uh, you could basically fly wherever you have a, 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 cell, a cellular signal. Um, so, so those are three kind of uh, quick examples of how we're aug augmenting um, the already awesome uh, e uh, ecosystem set up by drone, drone code. Um, uh, I really do have to say that I think my favorite part of, of all this is the community, and uh, it, they've uh, 
uh, Ramon and Gon already mentioned it, but it's it's really great. Um, there's Slack Slack channels which I'm on daily. Um, we mentioned it's like six six thousand folks on there, and it's it's a group of people like really wanting to help and and to like spread knowledge. So it's it's uh, I've learned a ton. Um, there are uh, uh, I have a funny story. I think we have time. Uh, I had a I had a bug in the in the PX4 firmware after we we kind of got our hardware going and. Uh, the 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 main man for the the Nutx in a, integration into PX4, uh, David said said uh, David Sidrain, he uh, only lives a, a couple hours away from me, so uh, I drove out to his house and he he uh, helped me <laughs> fix fix a bug. So that's kind of showing the community uh, uh, how awesome it is. And um, uh, there's the the weekly uh, developers calls. Um, Joining on that, I, I do that just to try to keep up. Um, the, the development is very fast and um, new features are being added a lot. And um, it's, uh, it's a great, great uh, way to stay in sync with the team. Um, and then there's always um, at time at the end to ask questions. Um, and the you go from people like me who are newbie, who's like, what's a magnetometer doing in the system to the actual pros um, who are like uh, creating the whole arch architecture. So you have this mix of people who are uh, very capable and willing, willing to help. So uh, that's been, that's been awesome. Um, so um, kind of the main takeaways, I would say um, my, I hope what, what my hope was is um, for people who uh, are developers out there who don't know how to develop on drone systems or aren't comfortable with that or kind of um, the, are afraid of the learning curve. Um, I was there like a year and a half ago. Um, so I started as an embedded kind of, kind of guy, um, not knowing where what anything about drones was. And then a year and a half later, um, where I've released product using the drone code hosted products. So um, uh, I hope uh, I ease any kind of uh, potential kind of like worry about, about getting going because uh, it's, it's a great uh, setup to, uh, to a start. So if you are kind of looking to develop hardware, um, there are, all the key takeaways are to reference the standards, uh, it will really save you time because there's a very good chance you could do like no coding um, or nearly no coding if you follow the hardware standards to a T. Um, if you're selecting com uh, like IMUs or stuff like that, you could see what's in the PX4 code, code base <clears throat> and then you can leverage the code that's already there, which is awesome, saves tons of time. Um, when you're bringing up firm, the firmware, there's references to use. So if, if, if you need to see how to bring a board support package in, uh, there's, there's a, you copy paste and start to tweak. Um, and then adding drivers, look, look for examples as templates and then leverage the weekly dev, dev calls. Um, and then uh, in system validation, um, I would say just look throughout the, the uh, there's so many tools to use. We use, um, in our production line, lots of the tools. So there's tons of Python scripts for like uploading the firmware, um, Mavlink connection. So there's all these little nuggets of, of treasures that are throughout the projects that you could that you can use. Um, and then uh, tune in to like the PX4 Slack channel and ask questions. Um, and then if you want to start to tweak things like like we're doing, there's just uh, a, a, a huge uh, play play playground of tools like Mav SDK, which allows you to do lots of fun things like like Gon showed you. Um, so uh, that's basically all I had to say. I want to say thank you for inviting me. Um, this this QR code you could scan and it takes you to some some links and you can learn more about Moodle AI if you're interested. Um, but um, uh, yeah, that's it. Let me know if there's any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Travis. So any questions from the viewers? And while we wait for those questions, thanks for your time today. It was a really awesome presentation and how to go to market with PX4. It's really refreshing to get a perspective from a manufacturer that is uh, integrating uh, most of the open source projects and most of these standards. So thank you again for coming in.
Um, if there's no questions, I think we can jump into the panel. Ginger, are, are you available? So we, maybe we can like skip ahead, jump into the panel, uh, and maybe the audience will get some more questions we, while we're discussing. Yeah, absolutely. So hi, everyone. My name is Ginger Zeng. I am the community manager uh, working at Drone Code Foundation. Uh, like what Ramon is saying, you know, um, at Drone Code, we really um, helped um, to build the sustainable ecosystem for open source drones. I'm really happy to um, be here today uh, to, uh, to, host this, to host this panel with the speakers. Um, I think we have everybody uh here and i think we are doing a drone queue right now maybe i should pull out my drone as well um so uh first of all i'd actually uh like to ask um the trisha in the background to help me with a pool um we want to be you know pretty interactive you know with the audiences the pool is going to be about you know like what your uh, what your background is you know how would you describe yourself um, Trisha, if you could, you know, help me operate the pool. Um, yeah, this is just to help us understand the um, demographic, you know, of the audiences a little bit better. You have a couple options, you know, software engineer, embedded system engineer, hardware engineer, or product manager, or if you're in business development. We will we'll, um, give just one or two minutes to uh, for us to collect the pool. Awesome, thank you, Ginger. Yeah, well, we wait for your answers. There's just one more option, uh, ready to fly vehicles. This is a hover games and a Vian XP, and this is the uh, M500 Vauxhall that uh, Travis was showing you right here. Awesome. I have a Holy Bro QAV 250. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I like that one. It's a smaller one. Much more yeah. compact. And you have to check the video from Model A High website where they build all the walls around the drones. That is pretty awesome. I, I would yeah. like to test that one day. <laughs> <laughs> Should, yeah. Very good. Google model AI and find their website, find that video. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Trisha is working on the pool. Thank you for uh, participating. If you um, have um, um, have filled out the pool, let's get started with the uh, with the panel. Um, I actually you now have a um, bunch of questions, you know, already lined up. Um, one thing, uh, a, a really quick, um, a really quick uh, plug. Um, we saw there are some questions regarding um, ROS, regarding you know math ROS. Uh, Ramon, would you like to actually um, talk a little bit about the uh, um, the upcoming event we have at ROS World? Um, because we have actually a a full track of content there uh, to to do really in depth discussion. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Junior. That, thanks for the reminder. So in November uh, 12th, uh, the Ross community is going to be celebrating their yearly event. Uh, this year is going to be named uh, Ross World 2020. And they graciously invited the Drunko Foundation. And we brought six uh, great sessions uh, with five speakers. We have all the way from getting started with PX4, uh, using Ross 1, Ross 2, all the interfaces and all the uh, toolkits that we offer as a community. Uh, like Travis was mentioning, we have lots of uh, different uh, projects within our ecosystem, not just the main uh, repositories. And then all of those are going to be covered by uh, our speakers during the ROS World uh, track. So yeah, uh, go check that out if you're interested in using PX4 and, and ROS. We have a really tight relationship with ROS community, and we have a really great interface that we've been developing over the years. So I encourage you, everyone, to go and look that up. Uh, if you go to our social media, um, at Drone Code Foundation and LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, you'll be able to look up the full track of the Ross World 2020 schedule for Drone Code. Awesome. Thank you, Roman. Um, yeah. So Nice. Okay. And also, so the um, 
um, maybe maybe just uh, a little bit more about just what Mavros is and um, um, uh, a little bit briefing, uh, just so the uh, audience can also understand. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, we mentioned that PX4 has a couple of interfaces where you can talk to them. One of them is Mapling. Uh, we've been discussing the, throughout the track today. So Mapling is our main interface. It's, it's what we like to choose as our de facto interface. But uh, in the initial times when we tried to integrate with ROS, uh, the way that the uh, developers did that was by translating from Mapling to ROS. So there's a utility called MapROS that does that for you. So it connects uh, through PX4 or to any uh, Mapling speaking drones, and it translates the Mapling messages back to uh, ROS messages. And uh, that's what we use for ROS1. It's really uh, built in, baked into the PX4 ecosystem. We're leveraging that every day. Uh, you can use Gase the Gazebo simulator and leverage all the uh, ROS toolkit to work with PX4. Out of the box, nothing needs to be modified. It's already there. And now, uh, since 2019, we have a ROS2 support uh, with fast RTPS. So uh, PX4 has a middleware uh, embedded between the architecture. So uh, thanks to UORP, which is a pub sub uh, middleware that PX4 uses, we have we're, have a very modular architecture. So thanks to that, we're able to make that compatible with DDS and speak directly to ROS2. So there's a now interface for more real-time connections. Uh, so you would take that a step ahead from uh, Map SDK, where you will need a more real-time connection. So you would like to define like flight, more specific flight modes. You have more tight control loops over uh, the autopilot. That's what you would be using. Awesome. And yeah, we're going to be check, uh, talking more in depth about those in the Rolls Royce um, 2020, November 12th. Uh, that's a free conference. Make sure you register for that. Uh, and it'll be awesome to see you there as well. Great. Then, um, Ramon, you actually mentioned one of the uh, great safety feature, um, yeah, you know, and awesome feature of PX4, which is the different flight modes. Um, I want to um, ask the, the 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 question in terms of um, um, for flight for flight mode. Um, what are the what are the usual flight modes um, in your regular development? You actually usually you actually usually use Travis, like for model AI in your testing. Oh yeah, so. Um... I do my, I personally will do a lot of uh, manual flight. <laughs> um, and then we use a, uh, cause we're flying, I fly inside almost all the time. And um, so it's a uh, position hold and uh, that's, uh, we could use that with the, the perception to kind of hold, hold our vehicle steady. Um, so the M500 development drone will go through um, the flight test using that. Um, one of the, one of the cool features we use is the offboard mode and what we do is uh, one of the products that's running as a Linux service is Voxel Vision PX4. Uh, this, this is kind of um, the Mavlink proxy, which will take Mavlink from PX4 and then shove it out network over UD, UDP and then vice, vice, vice versa. Um, so that same Linux service that's running on the drone, uh, it will be listening for the modes to uh, change uh, using Mav, Mavlink and when we detect an offboard mode, then we use a little C, C program to uh, send the uh, Mavlink commands to make the drone fly in a figure eight. So, so what we do is during like um, the production test of the M500, we'll, we'll put it into a figure eight mode and let it run there for 20 minutes until the battery dies. And then uh, that will let us know that things are running well. Um, and then all of our outdoor flights, we're using, um, the mission mission mode, um, like hold mode. So we kind of uh, touch all, like a lot of them. So um, very, very cool feature feature sets there. Great, yeah, great, great to hear that. And um, I think one of the one of the other key element that a lot of the audience probably also interested in, and we would love to touch on, is the safety aspect. Um, and I'd like to touch, you know, upon, you know, not only just um, from 
from Travis side, you can talk about, you know, how much testing you do on your products before shipping. And also, Ramon, um, maybe we can also introduce to the um, audience um, how Drone Code, you know, runs our um, our side of, you know, software flood, uh, plus hardware testing and the uh, flight testing aspect of it. Um, so we'll we'll actually go with um, with Travis again first on the yeah, product. So um, go ahead, Travis. Perfect. Um, so what? Uh, what I am, so uh, at the board level up, we are interfacing to the NetX shell. Um, and so using the built-in tools, you can run things like sensor status um, through NetX shell. And then um, over a serial port, we get dumps of data. So um, every one of our flight controllers will go through uh, production tests in which we, we validate the IMUs, barometer, the flash mem memory, uh, the SD card. Um, so every peripheral, every single connector, um, we can we can hit with shell commands basically in the NetX shell, and then get a response, and then log that for every single flight 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 controller. So again, that's using the built-in tools that are provided. Um, we didn't have to develop anything. I think I, I wrote a little little uh, PX4 pro, uh, program which shows up as a command line program, basically. I, I think it's called Moodle AI test. And then I, I buzz out all the connectors with that. Um, but other, otherwise, uh, we're using kind of the, the onboard command line inter interface to test every single sensor. Um, and then there's um, another concept called hardware in the loop, which we utilize um, and we can, we kind of we we run PX4 on our actual hardware, and we're kind of we're, we send simulated sensor data into into it. And because of the de, the decoupled nature of PX4, you could you it allows for a testable system, right? And the out the output of of running uh, simulated sensors on the hardware is the uh, the same to the outside world as a as a normal drone. Um, so hardware in the loop allows us to uh, simulate our hardware, and once again, it's it's code that I didn't have to write, and it was already set up by the uh, community. So so really, we're we're using uh, the tools that like people like Gon have have created, and we're using that in our production line. Awesome, that's great to hear, Travis. Then uh, I also like to uh, mention that Drone Code, um, as part of the foundation, what the off services that we offer to the open source community, we're helping out with the CI infrastructure. There's a test rack that one of the main lead maintainers has in their garage. Uh, we have a huge test rack with the hardware that we support with PX4. So every time we add a new hardware that we maintain, we typically ask the, the manufacturers that ship us aboard. Like Travis was mentioning, uh, it, it, that's all it takes. Is ship us aboard, we'll add it into the CI, make sure that every pull request gets tested. So we add that to our Jenkins pipeline. So it's in continuous integration uh, testing. And we have a test suite that actually uses map, leverages the map SDK. So every time you send the PR, it will actually go through that test suite the, using map SDK, run a couple of tests, verifying some of the functionality and run it real time in hardware using hardware in the loop. So that's one of the safety nets that we have to not introduce regressions. Of course, that like with every big mature open source project, uh, it's impossible to catch them all, but we try, we do our best. And we also have another layer of safety that is the drone code flight test team. So the flight test team is actually going out to the field and testing some of the biggest change sets that we think are going to be more impactful to the code base. So they have vehicles all the way from uh, quadcopters to vertical, big tip, vertical and takeoff and landing vehicles. We make sure and guarantee that the safety and uh, the feature set is actually doing what you're actually said it's going, going to do and it doesn't introduce any type of regressions. Uh, but it, I think really importantly here to mention is like the tutorial that Gong just showed you and how to like use Map SDK. That's essentially how you could write tests for Map uh, for PX4. You just write a Map SDK script and test it against the simulator. Make sure it does what you think it's gonna do, and then just submit the pull request and actually. Uh, fill out the requirements for the pull request and the GitHub actions is going to actually use one other of our tools that is actually really cool that we, I don't think we mentioned is uh, flight review. Uh, we have a 
cloud infrastructure where you upload the logs. So PX4 has a log format that's called ULOG. And after each uh, each flight has started and you arm your drone, a ULOG file is, gets created and uh, has very um, high sensitivity data, high rate data that uh, allows you to map and uh, plot uh, every type of sensor within your drone. So if you go to flight review right now, it's logs.px4.io, you'll see that there's a way to upload your logs and also uh, browse through the community uh, published uh, logs. So you can you get an option to upload it privately or publicly. You choose to do it publicly, you share that data with the depth, which is super tremendously helpful because we host all of those logs on S3 and we're able to run machine learning on them and learn a lot of what the community is doing, what some of the edge cases are, what some of the hardcore issues are. And uh, that's one of the biggest tools that we have out there for the community. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the things, some of the things that we are doing actively in the, from drone code and from, from the PX4 maintainer side to guarantee that there is always uh, stable releases and that we're not introducing regressions as we go. Like Travis and Gong mentioned, this is a very active community. So we get like a lot of pull requests <laughs> day to day and it's hard sometimes as the um, communities grow to keep up with those. So we're constantly introducing new uh, tool, tooling. And I encourage everyone to go to the PX4 developer call on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Uh, Europe Central Time. And uh, you'll get the latest on per component on PX4. So we go through the quick agenda. It will be like, OK, so what's up new for system architecture? What's new for multicopter? What's new for estimation? What's new for control? What's new for the map SDK? And then we go through all of those, and we explain why it got introduced. Maybe it's a bug that we want to talk. And uh, that's where you would get to know where we're introducing new things, where uh, there's a shift in tooling. Maybe we're introducing some of the uh, new stuff again, uh, you get to know about the release cycles and you get to meet the PX4 maintainers. So yeah, that's a great question, Junior. Thank you. Okay, awesome. And I think uh, we're launching our second poll. Um, uh, since you know we, we talk about that, we're actually trying to, um, the second poll, um, is, and is, is this your first time learning about PX4 drone development stack? If you have heard of us before, if you have not, we hope today's content, you know, was useful to you and that you would join for the code and stay for the community. Um, and of course, you know, if you already know about PX4 um, and, you know, are part of the community, we hope today's content is also um, help you, um, you would know, with some more insights. Um, Trisha, we, we, did, uh, we did launch the poll, right? It's coming. All right, so we, while we wait for the next question on the poll, uh, I think there's a question on the Q&A section uh, by okay. anonymous attendee. I think it, thank you, you enjoyed really much the map SDK section. I did as well, Gong did a great job. So he's got a Durantal fire controller. In order to test, is there a recommended uh, reasonably cheap drone that will be capable of this? So if you are using a Durantal, I would recommend a kit like the one that had Gong showed uh, the, uh, I forget the name of that kid. Uh, Gong, QAV, what's the name of the kid? QAV 250. QAV 250 by Holbrook. Yeah. Yeah, it's an ready to, it's, it's a, you have to assemble it, uh, but it requires minimal uh, time from or effort from your side, and you're able to put in your drone ball in there, uh, and you're able to fly your drone. So it'll be much less than a thousand, it'll be below 500. So while um, while we while we're on the subject, maybe I could yeah. um, also just showcase, uh, just show to the community, to the audiences, you know, how to um, navigate to some of these resources um, on px 4s website. So if you go to px 4i px4.io. Um, one of the question was, you know, like does px4 run like other things like rovers on um, or sailing boats? I think that was one of the question. If you go into ecosystem, um, you actually get a list of all the different um, uh, um, different drones that runs px4, including blimps, including um, there, you'll find some underwater vehicle as well. Uh, that shows you know how versatile this uh, the uh, the open source project is, and also um, I think there was another question regarding um, predefined board uh, that already 
that already like runs, you know, PX4, where you can easily find in the compatible hardware um, under the autopilot list. So once you get into your um, development environment, you 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 fork PX4, you'll be able to see all these boards, uh, um, um, and you know all their. Uh, you can go and find their documentation as well. Um, Meanwhile, another really good resource for people to get started is under um, community under projects. It will take you to um, actually our community hub, which is on Hackster, that has um, a dozen you know, of different tutorials, um, different community projects uh, that's also based on PX4 and um, in, in, um, to, you know, very good resource for you to get um, inspirations and, um, um, and and, and things like that. So, so, so go back to the question to um, add on to what Ramon is saying, what people could, um, could actually do is also go to getting started. Um, and then there um, all see all the dev kits that we have available in the ecosystem. Uh, ranging from, um, you know, what Gon has already mentioned, uh, including Model AI stuff kit, um, and you know, some other um, uh, Holy Bro stuff kit, and there are um, many others, you know, in our ecosystem. So yeah. uh, I like I like to make a special mention there. There's a lot of options for dev kits. Uh, we have uh, the IFOS, the Rock War by UbiFi, the Inspire flight ones. There's also the Hover Games uh, flight kit. If you go to hovergames.com, there's actually an open challenge with hackster.io where if uh, you get the kit and you accept to participate in the challenge, you get a huge discount on this kit. This is like a thousands of dollars and you pay something like 200 or 300 bucks and you get the whole kit and, and then you also get the chance to participate in that challenge, which is uh, helping with drones, how to solve problems in the pandemic. And that's a really cool challenge. I encourage everyone to go and check that out. Great. We hope you. We hope these uh, resources will help you um, to get started with drones. And um, actually, it was very interesting that to to hear Travis's uh, mentioning that you know a, a year and a half ago he when he came in as an embedded systems uh, engineer and how quickly um, by joining the open source community and um, help him uh, uh, and his and his company to really um, accelerate their go to market with the product and everything. So Gon, maybe you could also talk a, a little bit about uh, your experience, how you um, got got started with PX4 and um, and and your experience as um, you know because you also started not long ago as well, right? Yeah, right. Uh, I started uh, a year and a half ago too. So it's not my full time job. I do not work with embedded stuff and drone on my daily basis. I'm a, a full stack developer. I normally do. Uh, backend for websites and stuff like that but my thesis was in embedded stuff so I have some background in it so I started it by having a, a colleague in my work that worked with px4 and he worked uh, with Mavros his name is Nuno Marx he was my mentor and he introduced me to Ginger and we started getting along and Ginger started to tell me how to try this and try that. And I started trying things and I liked it very much. Then I, I got a drone from Olibro and I built the drone. And that, when I, that was the, the turning point when I started uh, seeing the drone fly, tried to fly it, crash it several times it will crash it <laughs> you 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 need to be sure of that and and if you if you use manual modes is is probably probably you are going to crash it but if you use the autopilots in auto modes it's very difficult to crash it unless you just send it a through a wall, but if you are on a open field, you it's very difficult to crash it in auto mode. So uh, I always I, I, I always like these kind of things before drones. I always liked Arduinos and that kind of robot things and RGB LEDs. Uh, but I never get uh, I, I never went into drones before talking to Ginger and Nuno. But when I got to it, I really liked it. Then I started uh, trying high-level stuff like Mav SDK and Mavros. 
and that really that really is something because it gives you a great layer of abstraction you don't need to know the firmware and all the algorithms implemented in the autopilot i don't know them and i never contributed to the firmware directly so if you want to build uh algorithms or computer vision or stuff like that you don't really need to know about the autopilot implementation you can use mav sdk mav ROS, interact with the drone and you don't really need to know the low level kind of things that that is my perspective but if you want to learn it you can always learn it there are a lot of people that are going to help you learn it uh, so that is my experience now i'm trying to do cool stuff Cool stuff with the drone. I'm trying to build uh, bridges instead of using the normal telemetry and kind of stuff like that. Uh, so that's my story. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. And the pool result just came in, and it seems like we have a, a, a fifty percent of you know, like the audiences today are software engineer, and about thirty five percent are embedded system engineer. So hope hope Gon's um, hope Gon's tutorial really helped you to understand, you know, like getting started with um, open source drone development. You know, like you can start from hardware or you can start from the software simulator side. And if you start with a simulator, you you probably don't, you know. Um, have the need to have the fear of you know crashing a a, a real drone you know like right off the bat um, um, it's 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 one of uh, those really really um, a really awesome a uh, really awesome um, getting started tool um, and will you'll be able to you know use it actually throughout your way you know as you um, advance in the uh, in the whole technical stat um, and i um, and it's, it seems like. Um, it seems like, you know, so we, so we launched an, another poll also, are you working on a drone related project or product right now? Um, and uh, it seems there's about 10% says yes, but there's another about 90% said no, but generally interested. Um, so hopefully, you know, today's content give you kind of like an idea um, of, um, 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 uh, you, you know, of like where to get started, you know, where the community is. We are a global community. Uh, part of actually also in our um, ambassador program is um, translation project. You know, the translation project is also open source, hosted on open source um, um, platform called Crowdin um, to enable the, um, um, the, the translation of the grant station software, you know, the, the user guide or um, be delivered in local language um, to, to, to reach all our different parts of you know the global ecosystem talking about the uh, uh, global ecosystem um, while we still have like four more minutes here left in the summit um, Roman like we um, you you mentioned about the uh, flagship annual developer summit um, we uh, would you like to um, talk a little bit more about that what that is like and um, this year we also hosted virtually um, yeah, definitely, definitely. So the PX4 Developer Summit is an awesome event. Uh, we hosted the first one, like I mentioned on my talk in 2019. Uh, to be completely transparent and open here, we're, we're friends, right? <laughs> we were expecting uh, somewhere around like 40 people to join us. In, I mean, it was Zurich. We were asking people to go to Zurich uh, to take a flight to Switzerland. And to our surprise, more than 200 uh, registered for them for the event and they showed up like we had one or two that didn't come to the event all the whole uh bridge sign up came to the event i think it was more around um a huge party around open source we had sessions around uh, getting started with px4 the map sdk we introduced the uh, new ROS interfaces we had the, it was the first time we met as a community to be honest and it was really cool everyone was really helpful and cheerful it was a time where we actually i personally realized how big and impactful was that's what this project was some of the maintainers uh the open source maintainers especially you get into this monotonous role of maintenance in the project where you're just answering uh, github issues prs uh, forum posts and all of that and sometimes you don't really notice where the questions are coming from. And we were getting people, we got people from all the continents. We got people from like dozens of countries. 
and uh, they were speaking a lot of languages. Like we, it's really important that the, the, the fact that you mentioned the translation project because we have translations in Chinese, in Korean, Spanish, and Portuguese, uh, in German, and the community is really worldwide. This year, we wanted to host the event in person again. Obviously, we couldn't because of the worldwide situation right now, but we hosted our event virtually. And to our surprise, more than 1,600 people registered for that. And to this date, we have more than 50,000 views on those videos. We're really proud of that. And we had more than 50, I think it's somewhere around 56 speakers this year. Uh, that was a huge event. I encourage everyone again to go look that up on the PX4 Autopilot channel on YouTube. All the sessions are free. They are around uh, 30 to 40 minutes long. They're very informative, very technical, but the, all the slides and everything are shared. So you can find links to those on the description of the video so you can follow along with them. Uh, most of those sessions and the videos, uh, we made them following the documentation. So we post them then back to the docs and you can find them in docs.px4.io or on the developer guide and all that. And the PX4 maintainers generally are really helpful and they're really trying to push things forward. So whenever you go to, uh, you see uh, next year's event, uh, make sure you pay attention to the agenda because those are the things that are gonna be discussing in the community or in the industry for the 12 next months. So the things that we were talking about in 2019 are the things that are being implemented right now in the market and in industry. So. Uh, we're like 12 months ahead of time in, in development cycle here. Like we see technology that is not reaching market yet in, in PX4 upstream. So I really can't stress this enough. Like the event to be for PX4 and open source drones is the PX4 Developer Summit. And it's uh, going to be hosted next year again. Uh, hopefully we can do it in person. If not, we'll host it virtually again. And it's gonna, probably going to be around July next year. Thank you so much. And we hope that you um, got a lot of useful information today from this Open Source Drone Summit. Um, our time is up and we have all the information here. You can visit the website, follow us on social, join our community um, on our Slack. Uh, we will be there, um, uh, really easy to find us. And hope that, you know, whether you are working on a drone project, you know, or just in, gen in general, like interested, we welcome to you to the community, to our, our open source community. And thank you again today for um, all your awesome um, presentations, Travis, Gone, and Ramon. Um, and thank you. We will see you around. Thank you, Open Source Summit. It was awesome to be here. See you around. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>